Okay, so today we're going to do more lists and looping. I'm not going to really show you anything today. This is just going to be a bunch of problems which we're going to solve together. And they're going to get progressively harder. So, the first thing that I want to mention to you is that everything that we had for strings, basically, we're also going to have for lists. Right, so we were able to iterate through the characters of a string in this fashion by saying for x is in x's do something, right? So we have the same type of structure for a loop. This is why I like Python. I like these types of statements. So if, you, if, I, if I create some type of list, a, b, c, d, e, um, I can say for x in x's, print x, and it's going to print a, b, c, d, e, right? So this is going to be a nice way to loop through lists. Um, this is better than I think C in Java, where you'd have to like make a for loop with an index and then use an index to count over the list, right? This is far more direct. So our first question today, write a function that removes all instances of x from a list x's. Um, so this should be pretty straightforward. If I remove a from a, b, c, I want to get b, c. And if I remove 2 from 1, 2, 2, 3, should get 1 and 3. And if I remove 0, let's say, from empty, I'm going to get empty back. Right? If you remove anything from empty, you're going to get empty back. So let's, let's try giving this a write. Uh, let's just code up this Friday. Eh. Uh, what did I call it? Remove x. Oh. What? Okay, from list, uh, from typing import lists. And what do I want to do? I want to define remove x. Define remove x. You're going to give me a list. I'm going to return to you a list. List. Uh, I won't write in the doc string because I'm lazy today. So if we remove x. Oh, I need an x. It's the first thing. So notice here that I didn't tell like the tell anyone what x x's type should be, uh, because why restrict it, right? X is going to be the type of whatever x is is containing. This should work for uh, numbers. This should work for floats. This should work for uh, characters, right? So it's uh, if I were to specify a type, it would make it weaker. All right, so 2 from 2, 2, 2, 1, or 3, that should be 3. Uh, maybe we can remove uh, from at, uh, p, a, u, l, and then that should return, rat. boom. Okay, so this should be pretty straightforward, what I want to do is I want to accumulate something, and that's something I want to accumulate is a list. Eventually, I'm going to return that list. Um, so I'm just going to step through. Oh, actually, no, there's an, OK, I'm going to do this in two ways. All right, I can say for x in x's. Um, if x, oops, I can't reuse x because I used it up there. So I'm going to use y. For y in x's, if y is not equal to x, then I can append my answer with y. All right, so let's give this a chance. Uh, Python interactive Friday. So let's see. Remove x. Uh, 2 from 2, 2, 2, 3. 3. Uh, let's try p, a. Oh, that's enough. Great. That works. OK, so let's do it a different way now. So that was a way using a for loop, um, but I could actually use a while loop here, and it may make things simpler. Because this is perfect, right? Because while x is in the list, I want to remove x, right? So that should also do it, right? Ah. Uh, remove x, 2 from 1, 2, 3, 4, 2. Yeah, great. So there's two ways of doing it. Um, pick one. I think actually the while loop here is nicer. It's very clear about like what's happening. 
and also has the benefit of actually um, uh, modifying the list in place rather than creating a bunch of new lists. Okay, so that was a good warm up. Range. Okay, so this is going to allow you to make for loops that look more classically like the ones you may have uh, used in C or uh, Java. Uh, what the range operation is going to do, it, it basically does the same thing that a list slice does, ex except actually like creates the indexes of the, well, what the list slice would do. I'm going to show you an example to make it more clear. Okay, so Python's range keyword allows us to quickly build uh, an iterator for a for loop. So remember that a for loop has to step, step through something that's iterable. Uh, the general form of range looks like this. So I'm going to explain to you now how to read these statements, right, because they're littered all over the pep manual. Okay, so we have range. It, ex it can accept three inputs, okay? When we write stuff in square brackets, that denotes that it's optional. Okay, so range uh, takes an optional start position, a non-optional stop position, and an optional step. All right, so it at minimum this takes one input, and at maximum it takes three. All right, so when you're looking through the documentation for Python, they often use this type of um, description to say what and what cannot go to a function. Right, so. We're not going to teach you how to write functions with optional parameters, but there are functions nonetheless that exist with optional parameters, and that's how they're described. If I ask for the range of 10, uh, you may be surprised when Python just spits back at you range 0 through 10. Right? So if you just specify the end point, it's going to assume that you're starting from 0. So, OK, well, that's not very helpful yet. So if I ask for the uh, type of the range of 10, it's going to say that I'm a range, right? So a range is something quite special. Um, if you want to actually look at the range, you can uh, cast it as a list. You can say return this range as a list, and then it's going to print out everything, right? So, but it's useful that range isn't a list, right? Suppose you wanted to create a range of a billion numbers. You don't want to create a list of length a billion. So range is something, range does lazy computation. Range only has the ability to tell you what the next thing is. Like, imagine you have a list, and the only two things you can do with the list are um, ask for the next member of the list. And that, sorry, you can do one thing for the list. You can ask for the next member. I can say, uh, give me a number, one. Give me the next number, two. Give me the next number, three. Give me the number that you gave me two steps ago. Oh, sorry, I, I don't remember that. Right, so th these iterators are very useful. It's generating things one thing at a time and then throwing everything else away. So let's look at this range more uh, specifically since I've written out all the answers here. And it's not going to be very interesting. Uh, okay. So I'm going to create a special uh, list here where the position is equivalent to the number that's stored. So for instance, x of 4 is 4. So uh, what happens if we slice this from 3 to 7 while stepping by 2? What numbers do we get? Well, what's at the third position? OK. 1, 2, uh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3. We want to go to 7, and we want to count by 2. So that's 3, 5, no, excluding 7, right? No endpoints. 3 and 5. OK, so now let's look um, at, I'm going to cast this immediately. So what, what is stored in range? OK, I'll, I'll do two things. Okay, um, I want to now talk about the range that goes from 3 to 7 of 2, but I can't because it's just going to throw that back. So let's list it, 3 and 5. All right, so th this is the equivalence, right? The range works exactly like the list slice. But instead of slicing, it returns the indexes right, of those things. Um, so we're going to be able to take a for loop through range. like So for x in range, I don't know, uh, maybe 7 to 5, step by minus 1. Print x's at x. Well, I shouldn't have used x's. I should have used i. And who cares? There we go, 7 and 6. OK, so what other examples did I have? 
273. Okay, so what if I ask for what range is from 2 to, I don't know, 7 to 1 by minus 3, what do I get? 7, 4, that's it. Yeah, 7, 4, that's it. Um, is this clear? Like, I don't, I don't know how much explanation this range really requires. It's, it's just the same as slicing, except it's immediately giving you back the, um, the indexes. So we usually do, do something like this. We usually say 4, i in range 10, right? And print i maybe. Right? And this, is a, this is how you do something 10 times. Right? This is, should be very familiar to those of you who've programmed in one of the more traditional languages. Um, so I forgot to put my pauses in, so I'll just show you the answers. So uh, here's an example. The range from 2 to 7, if we were to look at that, um, it's 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right? So left inclusive, right exclusive. Uh, range from 2 to 7, skip by 3, should be 2, and then 5, and then 8 beyond the boundary. Uh, list of range 2 to 7, step by minus 1, will be empty. Uh, list of range 7 through 2, um, stepping back by minus 1, will give you 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Okay, so now you have a way to, like this is going to be useful when we need to index stuff or count, right? If I wanted to repeat something 10 times, this is a good way to do it. Yeah, you in the next. That's a good question. I don't think it accepts integers. Sorry, I don't think it accepts floats. Yeah. But you can always multiply by the denominator. Right? So this is equivalent to going from range 0 to 20 by 1 and then dividing those individual uh, steps by 2. Step must be greater than 0 <laughs> is the error you'll get. Yeah. That's, yeah, I think stepping by zero would like, sh technically, mathematically, would be like an infinite list. Yeah, so that would be problematic. Anyone else have a question? No, okay. So I want to write now a function um, list range that actually generates the uh, range of A, B, C for valid inputs of A, B, and C, right? So I just want to return, <coughs> given zero, four, and one, I want to actually return uh, what list of range would return. So let's give that a try. Definition list range. I want to take a, which is an integer, b, which is an integer, c, which is an integer, and I want to return a list. Uh, I'm just going to put in a couple doc string examples. So list range. If I go from one to seven by two, that should be one, three, uh, five, and that's it. If I want to go uh, list range. Uh, 0 to 9, or maybe let's 9 to 0 by minus 4. That's going to be 9, 5, 1, I think. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, I want to construct or accumulate some type of answer and then return the answer. Uh, then maybe I want to say 4, uh, or maybe not 4. How do I do this? While? Yes. All right, so I'm going to append some type of index. Yeah, which is going to start at A. And while this index is let strictly less than the right endpoint, I want to append A to my answer. Oh, not A, index. And then I want to increase my index by what? So the first thing that's going to be appended is A. What's the next thing that, that should be appended? No, C, C is the step. I'm going, I'm going from A to B and stepping by C. So if the first thing I append is A, the next thing I should append is A plus C. Yeah, this. If I'm going from 1 to 7 and stepping by 2, and my first number is 1, what is the next number? 3. 1 plus 3. Do I have to write stuff on the board? Ugh, you guys are making me get up. 
Uh, so we have range of A, B, and C, right? So this is going to be equal to what list, right? A, A plus B, A plus B plus, oh, jeez, already screwed this up. Right? A, A plus C, uh, A plus 2C, A plus 3C, all right? And then I go all the way up until I surpass B, right? But I'm just, I just keep adding another step. So that's what this is doing. So let's give it a, let's give it a try. Uh, list range. Let's go from one to seven by two. One, three, five, perfect. Nine, zero, minus four. Empty, not perfect. What, oh, what have I done? Yeah, this, this condition is wrong. Can, to what? Oh, that's that's a good point. Okay, so I can just I should be able to. So this should be max of a and b. No, the I should start at the minimum of a and b, and I should go to the maximum of a and b. No, that's the same thing. So the problem here is I, I have to like make some code that figures out if I've gone beyond the endpoint. But I can go beyond the endpoint this way, or I can go beyond the endpoint in the other direction. So how can I do this now? Like I feel like I have to use some type of absolute value. Okay, I'm just gonna change my specification to not include negative <laughs> steps. Uh, and then you guys can go and modify this at home to make it correct, but geez, that was very sloppy of me. Uh, so 9 to 0 by 4 should be empty. Right, I'll, I'll try to fix, I'll, I'll, I'll correct it when I do this solution. Yeah, because that's the problem. You have to like sort of know the direction you're heading in order to stop. Anyways, so I would fail that one. Okay, so range is quite useful when paired with for loops, as I mentioned. So uh, if I have a list, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and I say for k in the range from 0 through the length of the list, skip by 2, and I print uh, x's at k. Uh, oh, geez, I don't have an output here. But this is going to print uh, 1, and then 3, and then 5, and that's it. Right, so... This is sort of how you would simulate the C or Java style looping in Python. Okay, so now I want to start getting into more of the meat, right? Today I really, really wanted to define matrix multiplication by the end of the class. So before we're going to do that, we're going to start with a simpler example. Do you guys remember what the dot product is or the scalar product? All right, so that's when you take two vectors and you take their dot product and what you end up getting is um, a scalar. So you just go through both of both vectors, and you take the product of the things that are in the first position, and you add the product of the things that are in the second position and the third position, and you carry on like that. So um, let's write a function that takes the dot product of two lists. So this is going to be one list of integers. This is going to be another list of integers. And this is going to return a what? Integer returns the classic dot product of x's with y's. Okay, so we're gonna have something like dot product uh, one two three four. Uh, it's going to be what? I know what it is. Just want to know if someone else knows what it is. Okay, I'll work it out. This is going to be 1 times 3 plus 2 times 4. Yeah, it's 11. Okay, so let's do another one. Dot product. Uh, 
four, one, four with zero, two, five. It's going to be 4 times 0 plus 1 times 2 plus 4 times 5. 22. Okay, so what I want to do is construct some answer. And this time I'm going to accumulate from 0, right, because I'm returning an integer. I'll return that answer somehow. And now I want to iterate through these lists. So I'm going to make an assumption here. Assumes the length of x's is equal to the length of y's, right? Because the dot product isn't defined otherwise. Um, so I'm going to say n is equal to, uh, maybe not. So for uh, some index in range of the length of x's, right? So this is going to print um, just consecutive numbers. OK, 0, 1, and 0. Oh, that's because I'm returning that as an answer. Um, so what do I want to do here? I want to say answer, what, what am I accumulating? Yeah, we want to do something like this, right? So I'm just going to print, uh, this is my k, this is my x's of k, this is my y's of k, and it's going to return nothing for the time being. So you see, that's going to increase this maybe. Okay, as I walk through this loop, okay, so k is 0, and x is at 0 is 1, and y is at 0 is 3, right? So I'm going to multiply 1 and 3 together, right? When k will increment to 1, uh, the position of at 1 and x is 2, and of y is 4, so it's going to pull 2 and 4 out, and then it's going to increment k to 2. Uh, and make uh, and pull out six and two, so and that will make it twelve, right? So we should have six plus eight plus twelve. So let's return this answer. I'm just going to get rid of this. Let's see. So three plus eight is eleven plus twelve is twenty-three. Twenty-three. Uh, let's see what happens if I give it empty lists. Zero. I think that's mathematically. Correct. Maybe not. Okay, but that's that's one. So that's good. Okay, so we have now have a dot product. So that, that's going to be useful for defining our matrix product. Um, let's write a function now that returns. So now when I ask you a question like uh, return the first fifteen of these, you now know how to generate a loop of exactly fifteen uh, loops. Okay, so. Let's now write a function which returns a list of the first k squares. I don't know why that's, this should be a list of an integer, not list of list. I'll correct that. OK, so let's return the first k squares. That, sh that should not be very hard. Uh, define k squares. Uh, it's going to take k, which is an integer. It's going to return a list, actually a list of integers. Returns the first k squares. Uh, so k square of uh, 3 should return 0 squared, 1 squared, 2 squared. Uh, k square of 0 should return the empty list. Okay, so this one's pretty straightforward. I'm going to accumulate a list and then return that list. Uh, for k in the, oh, I can't use k. So for x in the range of k. I want to append to my answer x squared. So let's check out how this one guy works. So k squared, uh, maybe 14. 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, great. OK, so, so the reason I showed you this is I want to show you my favorite thing about Python. And this is list comprehension. So I could also generate the first 14 squares by doing this. I can say I want a list, and this list is um, all x squared for x in range, uh, I don't know, let's say 5. Whoops.
Very powerful stuff, this list comprehension. I love it. Yes. You have to speak up a tad. Yeah. Ah, uh, because I'm returning the first case squares. So it's 0 squared, 1 squared, 4 squared, uh, 2 squared. So 0, 1, 4. Did I do something wrong? OK, no, no, no worries. Like, it's, it's quite possible I screwed up as well. I don't, it's probably likely. Um, OK, so back to this list comprehension stuff. I love this list comprehension stuff. Because uh, eventually you're going to be learning things like map and filter. Uh, so just keep this in mind, that if you want to generate a set or a list of something with some property, that this is a very quick way of doing it. I think I may have a slide. Yes, list comprehension. So do you guys know what the set builder notation is? I think you've probably seen it in high school. They just never used this name for it. So like in mathematics, you can say stuff like, oh, generate, generate me the set of squares. That would be k squared such that k is a natural number. Um, we, we have more or less the same style. Um, you, except in, instead of saying such that, we use four. And you can actually uh, embed these more, but you know, the one level ones are, are fine. Um, so if you ever need to generate uh, a list of stuff quickly, th this is a great way of doing it. Write a function which disassembles a string into a list of characters comprising the string. So this would, like, this would be like splitting on the empty character. OK, so I want to disassemble maybe A, B, C, D, E, F into a list of A, B, C, D, E, F. Let's see how I would do this one. Definition, disassemble. Did I spell that right? Not a chance. Disassemble. I want to take some characters, which is a list of strings. And I want to return a, oh, no, sorry. I want to take a string and return a list of strings. Oh, go away. So something like disassemble uh, verbic. That should give me v r b i k. And maybe if I disassemble the empty string, I should get empty back. OK, so again, um, I ask myself here, what do I want to return? So I want to return a list of something. So my accumulator should start with the empty list. I don't know if you notice that I, this is how I sort of operate. Um, my accumulator is always the smallest return type. right? So I was returning a list here, so I started accumulating from the empty list. Here I was returning an integer, so I started accumulating from 0. Right, so there's a there's a pattern here. Right, my whatever you're accumulating should be the smallest, or should be the zero of the data type. Right, so the zero of the lists is an empty list. So I'm going to return this. Um, anyone have any idea how this is very easily solvable? Yeah. Ah, uh, she's too smart. <laughs> So it is the case that you can typecast as a list a string, which is the trivial answer to this problem. Could I have the less trivial answer? Can anyone give me an answer? That's a perfectly, that, it, not, even, not only is it the perfect, perfectly good answer, it is the best answer. But I was trying to use loops. Yeah. Oh, you want to use list comprehension. Yeah, great. Okay, let's use the list comprehension for this one then. Return a list C for C in C's. <laughs> That's one way of doing it. All right, that will work. Good job. Yeah, this is probably the solution that I would have come up with, but I'm going to step take it a step back and, and make it very... Uh, Clear. I'm going to say just uh, for C in C's. Ugh. For C in C's, if C is not equal to, oh, for C in C's, just append C's to the answer. And that's uh, another one. That's the sort of most basic one. I'm just stepping through the list and depending. 
So that should also work. Great. We got three answers for that one. All good ones. Okay, so this is where things may start getting a little bit nutty. Okay. We are going to start embedding lists of lists, right? So um, you can regard a matrix as sort of a collection of rows, right? Row 0, row 1, row 2, row 3. Um, or you can see it as a collection of columns. The point is, is that in order to operate with matrices, which is going to be critical for doing a lot of things, we're going to need some sort of type of structure to uh, deal with it. So a list can have another list of elements, right? So here's a list. It has two elements, which are themselves lists, right? So um, the length of x's is 2, and the length of the last element of x's is 3. Right? This would have been a lot better if I didn't was not uh, did not had not forgot to hide the uh, the answers. But let's let's do this in the interpreter. I'll just grab this. Uh, so let me just add one more thing here. One, two, four. Okay. So now I have like triple triple embedding. What's the length of this list? Three. What's the length of the last member of this list? What is at x's of 1? What is at x's of 1 at minus 1? OK, so yeah, it resolves left to right, right? Because it could have been either way. OK, so uh, what about this? Colon. No, no, I'm saying what would what will the compiler give me if I type this in? Okay, you can't index in a matrix like this. Right? This is a list of lists is not an array. Is what I'm trying to get at here. Right? So um, the reason that this works is because Python says looks at this and it says I need to find uh, okay, so there's two indexes here. So x is at one returns a list, which that and that list is also indexable, right? So I can say this. So remember, this is my x's. I can say x is look at the last one, uh, and look at the third, second thing in there, and then the last thing. What's this going to give me? All right, so let's step through it. Whoops. So x is at one at minus one is what? 1, 2, 4. So x is at minus 1 at 2 should be 1. So x is at minus 1 at 2 at minus 1 should be 4. Right? Because you, you index, it returns something, which then you can index. And it returns something, which then you can index. Right? But you cannot say this. Okay? For that, you need something totally different called a matrix, which you can import with NumPy if you really care to find it. But at the moment, a list of lists aren't indexable in this manner. And so this will actually complicate things a bit. Um, so loops can also be nested. right? So sometimes it's uh, necessary to, when you're like looping through a list of lists, you're also going to want to loop through the lists that you're pulling out. right? So for instance, if I have this, uh, a super list, x is equal to the list 1, 2, and then the list A, B, C, and then the list hello. If I say uh, four x's in this list of lists, and then four x in x's, and I print x, um, here's a handy tip. If you ever want to print a lot of stuff horizontally rather than vertically, you can just tell print what line ending to use. So typically it uses like a new line as a line ending, but you can say use a space instead. Okay, so this is just going to walk through each member of this list uh, and print it. Now, this basically is the answer to the next question, but the next question maybe we can conceptualize it a little bit better. So let's assume that students are uniquely identified by integers, right? student numbers. Well, write a function. Uh, uh, this is a badly phrased question. OK, so assume that students are uniquely represented by numbers. And then I break 
the uh, students into teams. And now I want to check that each member of each team is an enrolled student. Right, so I'm saying this is going to require uh, two loops that are embedded. So let's, let's do it this way. Enrolled students. All right, so I'm going to have teams. And teams is going to be a list of lists of integers, right? So a list of teams. Uh, and then I need to know the enrolled students. Oh, it should be enrolled teams. Enrolled students, which is going to be just a list of integers. And this is going to be returning a bool. Ooh, coming out of my line endings. Okay, so this should work somehow like this, right? So I have, I'm going to pass enrolled teams a list of teams. All right, so first of all, let's assume that the students who are registered are student one, student two, and student three. Uh, one breakup of teams could look like this. So I have a team with two people, one and two, and I have a team with three. And this should return true because each member of each, each, member of each team is actually an enrolled student. Uh, but then this should return false if I sort of uh, put a team member, uh, student seven, on the second team. Then this is false, right? Because uh, student seven is not enrolled. So how can I do this? This is going to take two two do loops, right? So um, for a team in teams, I want to look at every member of that team, right? So for team in teams. For student in team, if student not in enrolled students, return false. And then if I get through this whole thing, return true. Are you okay? Okay, so like this is why I like Python, right? Like look, look how nicely you can read through this code. It's very clear to like any Python programmer what this would be doing, right? For team in teams, look at each student in that team and then test that student for an enrolled student, right? If this was done in C, this would all be indexed. You'd need an, ind you'd need an index variable at every loop. Right? And then it'd be I, then it would be J, and then you'd be comparing these indexes straight. This is just blah. Right? Look at a team in all the teams, and then look at a student in that team. Right? This is very nice. I, this is why Python is so powerful. Well, I'm, I'm speaking as if I've tested my code and it works, so let's see. Uh, enrolled teams. Uh, so I have my team. Oh, how did I do that? That is interesting. Uh, enrolled teams one. Oh, I have a team one, team two, team three. My enrolled students are one, two, three. This should return true. Perfect. And this should return false. Perfect. Right. So, anyways, appreciate the simplicity of this statement right? because it would look very messy in other languages. Right. I was telling one of the other students the other day that maybe you guys haven't appreciated this because you're too young at the moment. Uh, you've never written a piece of code. And then maybe years later, had to look back at it. <laughs> right? So I've written pieces of code like 10 years ago that I sometimes have to look at. And you're not going to remember. If you don't uh, use clever variable names or write a doc string, you're going to have no idea what, what your code you wrote 10 years ago does. You'll be cursing yourself. Right? So uh, I know it seems like quite verbose when we're writing it now. But just think of, your, think of yourself 10 years later thanking you for writing in a style that's more readable. How much time do we got? Do you, oh boy, four minutes. I can't do matrix multiplication in four minutes. Maybe I can do it on Monday. We'll try at the beginning of class. Okay, what I want you guys to do, uh, okay, I have, s we've done this. Okay, I want you to guys to do this question. Uh, okay, I'll throw this, I'll make this a lab question. I'll, I'll put this in the lab. But I want you guys to do this by Monday. Just you guys. 
because I'm going to do matrix multiplication. We're going to need to be able to take the transpose of a matrix, right? So write a function which takes a matrix, which is a list of lists, and returns another list of lists, which is the transpose of that matrix. And I'll see you Monday. You guys have a safe and pleasant weekend. No, no, jazz hands. Jazz. There we go. There we go.